enough is enough Hey guys, welcome back to the No Holds Barred Network with another episode of Under the Ropes. I'm your stressed out host as always, the EVP giggles, the heartbreak chick, the queen of the Indies, Tiffany. And I'm always joined by the law, Ray Ramundo. And then today's special guest, I'm actually really excited about this, GCW's Tournament of Survival winner, uh, Alex Colon. What is going on? What's going on, y'all? How y'all doing? I'm good. I'm a little stressed out that we're not doing this live. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> no, technical difficulties. It happens. Oh my uh, goodness! Only, only. Uh, content I think created. I think YouTube couldn't hold the excitement of. That's what it was. I think that's what like, it is. <laughs> yeah, you got so excited that you even you did the intro perfectly. At least you got the intro good. Yes. But it just it couldn't hold the excitement so that's what it is so like we got to get one of my favorite that death match wrestlers on the podcast so i'm totally excited about this so i think that's what it is i broke youtube and all that so <laughs> uh. anyway guys if you've never listened to under the ropes we hear we interview anything with the independent wrestling world, uh, wrestlers, promoters, referees, ring announcers, anything related to independent wrestling, we want, we got you guys covered over here. So, uh, Ray, is there anything else like I'm missing off of this? I know you're nailing it so far. Let's keep it going. All right, let's keep it going. So, Alex, are you ready for this interview? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. Uh, all right, let's let's do this. Okay, so of course, me and Ray are very familiar with you, but maybe some of our viewers might not be familiar with you. So, can we talk a little bit about how you got into professional wrestling? Yeah, um, uh, I backyard wrestled <laughs> with a lot of people that are uh, actually in the business now: Joe Gacy, Lindsay Dorado, Fidian, uh, a bunch of other guys. Uh, we had a, a little backyard fed going on, and um, one of our uh, guys that was in our fed, Joe Gacy's brother, actually worked with Lobo of CZW fame. And at that time, CZW was kind of splitting up with Chikara, and they were kind of doing their own thing. So the school was about to open up. Uh, we got Lobo. Somehow they got Lobo to come to the uh, backyard show, which, thinking about it now, it's like, oh, it's kind of awkward, but... He showed up and uh, he had a good time and um, he told us about the school opening up and um, a bunch of the guys ended up going to the school. I kind of went in a separate direction. Uh, I knew someone who knew Tommy Cairo. He used to wrestle for ECW back in the day, did a couple Japan tours. Um, I started training with him and then eventually uh, when the CZW school opened up officially, I switched over to the CZW school and started training there and that's kind of how it all blew up. Oh, wow. Pretty cool. Well, Pretty cool. Right time, right place, I guess. <laughs> Usually how it goes, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, go ahead, right. Uh, let's keep it going. Let's talk a little bit. I always like to ask about um, character evolution. So, can you talk us a yeah. little bit about your time getting from uh, Four Loco Alex Colon to now <laughs> the Alex Colon that we know in present day? The deathmatch guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. The four loco thing was was just uh, it was uh, obviously it was a way to uh, try to get me over more as a heel. Um, up until that time, I had been trying to establish myself as a singles wrestler, and um, I guess the whole faction storyline thing kind of came into CZW. We had a lot of factions running around at the time, and they thought it'd be a good idea to kind of pair me up with a bunch of other Latinos in the promotion how cliche <laughs> um so i mean th that's how it kind of ended up happening and then it was like it was me and chrissy and it was like who else are we gonna throw in here and it was as and bandito came up and i thought they were perfect because like i'll say all the time i felt like they never really got their due there they were two of the best wrestlers around in the tri-state area and um we they put them with us and uh we kind of blew up with the four loco stuff that's crazy it's crazy. Yeah. Then, uh, a little throwback I mean, there. A little throwback. <laughs> I mean, and, and you know, like, I felt like those guys were so talented. It, it was kind of weird at the time because I kind of got put in the lead role because, obviously, the company was trying to really put some investment in me. And it was understandable, but I don't know if I was exactly ready 
to lead a group of guys who had been in the business probably triple the amount I have. But, you know, we all made it work. They did the best they could to, to try to teach me along the way. And um, granted, it, at, at the end, it kind of it went its own separate ways, which really not our fault. It's just the way the evolution of shit happens. Um, and then around the time it all kind of broke down, CZW kind of stopped using me a lot. And, you know, that's a whole lot of negative shit I've probably explained in plenty of podcasts. But uh, they stopped using me a lot, and I was kind of on the brink of quitting. And then me and Danny Havoc, for whatever reason, got really close. And um, he kind of drugged me into this deathmatch stuff. And uh, next thing you know, I have a match with him. And then after that, I'm getting praise about it from people. Um, I was still struggling at the time. And at some point, he got me into the GCW because he was uh, doing commentating and a bunch of other shit there. Um, and then from there, it, it was just off to the races with deathmatch stuff. I love it. I love it. I love that me and Ray actually got to go to the tournament of survival a couple of weeks ago. So I was so excited. And it was my first tournament to watch. And it's funny because sometimes I cringe with some of the death matches. Ray can vouch for me on this one. Um, but I'm obsessed with light tubes. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, so I was <laughs> loving you and Ricky. Like that last match, I was I was going nuts, right, Ray? I was going absolutely nuts. I was like, Tiff's in like deathmatch heaven right <laughs> yeah. now with the light tubes. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. it's like, oh my God. But then like, ah. No, but not with light tubes with though. No, and, uh, <laughs> Not with light tubes. For whatever reason, like it's the best. It's like Christmas for me, right? Like... <laughs> It really is. It's like Christmas for me. Um, but I also like the fact I, I watched GCW yesterday, too, and you and Chris Dickinson went at it, which was an amazing match as well. And I kind of put a tweet out also that I was like, I love the fact that maybe some people who aren't familiar with independent wrestling, that they might not know that, you know, deathmatch wrestlers can go to and wrestle in a technical match. So I love that GCW can do both for it so like i appreciate the back and forth between deathmatch and like maybe like a regular technical match so yeah i think a lot of people don't i don't think a lot of people like sometimes people forget that everybody has to go to wrestling school we all have to learn how to wrestle when we're there you know uh we all have to put the time and work in so and then uh my first like 10 years of wrestling i didn't really do any deathmatch or hardcore stuff like that i may have done one or two but uh, outside of that, I was pretty much wrestling. Like, all the Four loco stuff, pretty much all the stuff before then, the, the Spanish Armada tag stuff with LJ Cruz. That's all, like, straight wrestling. So I think maybe people have forgotten. And, you know, there's also a new wave of fans. Like, uh, I don't know how long you guys have been watching independent wrestling for, but, like, there seemed to be a new surgence of fans after a certain year, I'd say. Because I started in 07. The fan base was real different. Like, it was real hard to to get over quote end quote uh it was real hard to become a fan favorite they, the fans wouldn't just let you in their circle like you had to earn it um nowadays people are way more accepting which is fine you know everybody just wants to really enjoy wrestling and especially during this time we're all just looking for something to keep our minds off of all that negative stuff going on so uh yeah i mean it's just a, it's a different time and uh i think uh the newer fan base just sees me as a guy who does light tubes and death matches and they don't really know that I've been wrestling for almost 14 years. And a primary amount of those years is just straight wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. oh man. That's true. Like me, I got hardcore into independent wrestling about a little over a year ago. Even though like I had seen some before the fact. But I dove so deep probably the last year that I started going to promotions that I didn't even know existed so I, I had this love for it and I'm I'm a big AEW girl so uh it's very different but I think my heart is so into the independency nowadays uh more than that because I'm going like literally like every weekend to new shows so I love it and I appreciate it. And I know we've had other wrestlers on the podcast. Uh, we've had Lucky 13 on too. And we were talking mm -hmm. about this as well with him. And he's like, you know, I've been wrestling a long time. Right? <laughs> like, yeah. Was, People tend to forget. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, well, I'm kind of like new, kind of still into the independent scene. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, was, I, I, yeah. I think what it is, a lot of fans that were like, the hardcore, like, there's a time, like, I think from 02, maybe to, I want to say to that 07, that, like, it was New York heavy. Yeah. Like, if you got over in the tri-state, 
you were hot. Mm-hmm. You were going to get. But yeah. then the fans got a lot harder because yeah. it started to vary. Like the independent circuit grew. And I want to say till like 2015, it got that bloom again. Because yeah. I got big into indies around, I want to say 2010 around there. And that's when you start seeing like the fans change. It started to get that bloom again. And I feel like yeah. right now we're in that time frame that fans just want to see everything. Right. And if they like it, right. you're, you're good. Like, it's is it's it's crazy because when I when I started wrestling in 07, even when I was like, because I've really got into the independence in 04. Like I, I would watch it here and there in the early 2000s because CZW was on syndicated TV, and then you had TNA, so that's where I first really seen guys like Red, and then he would be on like CZW with the SATs and shit, and I'd mark out hard. But uh, <laughs> 04, like I went to a cage of death, and then I started like oh, shit, what's Jersey All Pro? So I'm watching Jersey All Pro. I'm like, oh, my God, there's all these people I don't even know about. And then 07, I get in, you know, and it's just, man, it's it's a different, like you said, it's a different landscape. Like, uh, the fan base was just so different. I feel like they were harder, which is fine, you know, and nowadays everybody's just way more way more accepting, which, which is easier for the younger guys to not get so caught up into all the stuff outside of the ring. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And that's Definitely. why we preach so hard about the independence scene. And that's why we love doing these podcasts because we're so passionate about it. Um, and I think people sometimes don't realize that it all starts from the independent scene. And this is why the bigger platforms, they start here. So you guys are so important to the later bloom of of being signed or not. I mean, there are some people that just decide to stay in the independent scene, and I'm appreciative of that as well because I love it. So I get to see my favorites in the scene all the time. So why are you laughing at me? <laughs> no, I, I laugh because it's so true, though, and I feel like not many people realize that. Well, like a lot of people disregard how important independent wrestling is, and now more than ever, you see there's a big interest in it. Yeah. Like I can say when a lot of us are younger, we didn't know there was an indie scene. And the indies mm-hmm. isn't just like came out of anywhere too. Yeah. Like the independent circuit has been around and it truly is something that again, if you're watching right now, definitely check out your local indie. Yeah. Like definitely give it a chance it. and you'll be astonished with the time. Yeah, definitely. We're always preaching that. Um all right, so let's keep this moving. So I like to ask, I've been liking to ask this question a lot lately, but um, do you have any like pre-match rituals before, uh, you know, you get into the ring? Uh, not really. Like I'll, I'll obviously I'll pray once or twice because <laughs> that's super <laughs> important going into some of these matches because my nerves and I've talked to some wrestlers and they're, they'll tell me they don't even really have nerves anymore going into death matches. And I'm just like, I don't understand that because <laughs> i get nervous before every death match because you're going into something very dangerous and it's like yeah. anything can happen so that's probably the only pre-match ritual really i can think of that i'd have before any match okay okay <laughs> interesting hey it's something like we've heard some crazy stories of just pacing and even like uh, one guy told us he slaps himself just to psych himself in. It's like, <laughs> hey, I guess whatever gets you, you're a gentleman. Yeah, yeah. Diddy um, Limelight has I'm going to get hit in the face a bunch during the <laughs> so I'm not going to hit myself. He's so like, like I don't need to knock myself out anymore that I already get. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I like to ask this important question, though. This is one that I feel like is really defines like the person themselves. Um, what does stepping into the ring mean for you? Um... <sighs> How do I, I'm trying to figure out how I can best explain it. Um, it's it's something that's become a real big part of my life for at least 14 years. Um, you know, and when you start thinking about becoming a professional wrestler, you have the, all these dreams of grandeur and stuff, and you really don't understand the amount of hard work it takes to get to a certain point. You know, even me, I'm not at a big, big platform, but, like, it took so long for me to get to the point of where I'm at and for for it to actually be worth it because when you first start out you're you're basically you're wrestling for pennies on a dollar like praying to eventually get to the point of somebody like in it when i'm coming up it's like brian danielson low-key amazing red you know all these roh guys like it was, it was a different time and it's like you're hoping to get to a point where you can literally um provide for yourself with wrestling you know and i i feel like i'm at the point where like you know i could pretty much I could handle, you know, some of the assets uh, around my life with the means by wrestling. So um, I think that's just it. It means it means a lot. I really don't have 
too much of an explanation other than that. It's it's become like a part of my life, almost like a family member. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. That's, that's amazing great. to hear. Yeah, man. definitely. Love it. Uh, we have a fan tweet from our friend MGB Graham. He said, having just watched an amazing five minute long video on YouTube called The Best of Alex Cologne, what do you consider your best highlight real clip? Ooh, um, wow. There's a, <laughs> there's a bunch. Uh, man. Um, maybe I uh, did a tag match right before Danny Havoc retired at TOD. And I did a Spanish fly off of a scaffold. And for some reason, I remember that exact moment because there was a fan cam video that somebody put out on Twitter at the time. And I remember Tony Deppin on the far left. And as soon as I did it, he turned around and look on his face was like, what the hell did he just do? <laughs> like, it was amazing. I've never seen a look on his face like that ever again after that. <laughs> I love Tony Deppin. He's another one, one of my favorites. We've had him on Under the Ropes, too. One of the most nicest guys. And oh, my goodness. <laughs> or he's dead. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's great. Um. So with everything you go through with death matches, how do you deal with the result after like blood and glass and all that? A lot of a lot of screaming in the shower, people <laughs> thinking someone's getting murdered in the hotel room. Oh no. Um you know, and I'm still healing from TOS. Like I have two pieces of glass in my back I'm trying to purge out right now. Oh my goodness. Uh, I had one I took out of my knuckle the other day. My hands are still kind of split open a little bit, but they're getting better. Um you know, like I tell everybody, death matches they they seem cool, but like when you're doing them, those after effects, like once your adrenaline's down, it's it's the worst. And then me in my 30s, getting older, like it, the healing time just continues to go up and up. And you know you can't do it forever, so you just got to take advantage of it now. Oof. <laughs> like I can't even imagine. Like I give you guys so much credit. I don't know how you endure doing. Like I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> never so i can it's a lot of so people cool <laughs> yeah it's 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 cool to watch but i always right right i always say this i was like i don't know how they do this right no i don't know how you guys do it, it. <laughs> man like i used to complain like again being in wrestling training still doing it and i'm like yeah the normal bums hurt like hell and then i'm thinking yeah i don't know if i could add the other stuff that's just like <laughs> And I think every like every person that's ever stepped into the ring or ever trained or even wrestles now, they just they think about like maybe I could do one. And it's like I give you guys credit for putting your bodies on the line every time. Oof. Like I feel like you have to have that different kind of spirit to do it because yeah. it's not just yeah. something I feel like you could do once and you're gonna be like, okay, that's it. Like no, like you get in there, you're willing yeah. to do a lot. Yeah, you like, guys are not. Well, you know, everybody. It seems like a lot of people who are in the straight straight regular wrestling world would you know think about it i hear a lot of guys tell me that they want to do one you know and that's fine i get it. it but it's like it almost takes a different human being to be able to do something like this every weekend trust me it's i don't understand how i do it every weekend i'm like i i doubt myself all the time I'm like eh, maybe i'm gonna quit soon because this is getting rough <laughs> Next weekend, I'm back to doing it again. Oh, so. my goodness. Like, I need to personally see, like, physically. Like, I need to be there because I think it's happened before. Correct me if I'm wrong. You and Akira. If, has that happened before? I feel like I've heard that it's no. happened. It ha Okay. No. So, whenever this happens, I need to be there. <laughs> it's, like, it's like my dream death he, match right now. He blames me for his venture into deathmatch wrestling, <laughs> and I blame him for not listening to me when I told him not to do death matches. Yeah, he actually told that story yeah. on the podcast, yeah. and it's like, I don't think he, he he blames you, but then it's like the stuff he does as well. Like, man, okay. you, could, you could just go back to, to regular wrestling. Like, yeah. even this week he posted a video of that cut again reopening. Oh my god! And it's like. Said, him having fun with it. Like, yeah, he was yeah, playing with it. Like, <laughs> like, what are you doing, you nut? Like, <laughs> I love him dearly. I like. I. I. So I need. So Danny Demonto needs to make this happen because I need to be there, like front row, to see this match. So it's like my bucket list match of you guys. And me and Ray actually booked um, Indie Slam where we did our own fantasy cards, and you guys were my main event for that day. So <laughs> I need to see it. <laughs> So, um, uh, Ray, go ahead. You take this fan tweet. Okay, got it. We have a fan tweet here from our friend MGB Mason. They ask, 
Oh wait, no, sorry. It's actually MGB. Yeah, Mason. Uh, Mason. Oh, yeah, Mason. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I was like trying to make. There's sure a couple good. of them. Um, you clearly have a high stress show for pain, but is there anything like a mundane pain that gets you, like stubbing your toe in somebody? <laughs> so, so I guess like, is there any little thing that's like usually it's like, oh man, that hurts, <laughs> that gets you, <laughs> like. Uh, and I don't have a high threshold for pain. I think people are just miss have a misconception. Maybe Schlack has a high threshold for pain because I feel like he feels nothing. I, on the other hand, feel everything and just make it seem like I don't. But trust me, I feel everything and it sucks. Um, people, I don't get it. It's just because I just cause I'm letting somebody plow a, a gusset plate in my head doesn't mean I don't feel it. I feel it. It sucks. <laughs> Oh man! Uh, I feel like that's a misconception. Yeah, there. Like, it is. Everyone thinks you guys are like inhuman, but I remember just <laughs> that day are. hearing you guys like some reactions toward it, and I'm like, oh man, they're really beating the crap yeah. out of each other now. <laughs> like, Oof! God bless. <laughs> I think some people are like uh, Schlack and Eric Ryan seem to have this weird high threshold for for just uh, the gruesome and the pain. I don't. Just because I'm good at it doesn't mean I don't feel every bit of it. Like, I feel like we're going to have to get them on the pod and ask them these questions, Ray. All right. Keep keep a note for this question so we can get slack on. These guys aren't human. I don't get it. <laughs> we're going to be like, Alex said you're not human. So <laughs> what's the story there? Uh, well, he says no God, only Schlack. So there maybe, you go. Maybe that's it. He's immortal there. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep it going. Now, I have a question here. So, let's go. How do we get from Four Loco to Blackout to even Lowriders, the low throwbacks here, would you say you prefer that to be in the team slash faction format or to be a single star? I think everything has its place. Like, uh, there's always, like we were saying earlier, there's the evolution of everything. There's the evolution of everybody. Like, this deathmatch, this whole deathmatch phase of me is just my evolution towards the end of everything, you know? Because I don't, uh, I tell everybody, I don't plan on going forever. Like, I'm not going past 40. That's just not, especially deathmatching the way it is now. Like, granted, like, if you watch stuff from early 2000s, it's a lot of hack and slash. There's not really any wrestling or motive to anything. Nowadays, we're, we're well more equipped with the wrestling. Like, a lot of guys can tell better stories. And they have a, a lot more tools to use in a deathmatch ring, but um, the what the uh, amount of speed, the hard, as hard as a lot of us go, like I can't myself imagine doing it past the the age of forty. It's just it's too rough, man. It really is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oof. Um. Okay, so again, here's here's another question for maybe fans that might not be familiar. What move do you define as your finisher, and what made you choose that? Uh, Spanish Fly, and I think that's more of an homage to the SATs because, you know, I'll, I'll shout them out every now and then because uh, when I was in Force One a very long time ago, you just go back into the history books, annals. <laughs> um, there's a promotion called Force One. And uh, the original Four Loco was actually me, a guy named uh, RV1, and the SATs, which uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from the SATs. Uh, and, um, you know, I got a chance to wrestle for their promotion back in the day a couple of times. And uh, they would, I would hit them up every now and then to get some advice and uh, good dudes. Um, you know, and I just felt like it just fit, you know. I'm Puerto Rican. I like coming off the top rope with shit, so why not, you know. Just an homage to a to a tag team that I grew up watching in the early 2000s on the independent scene, and they'd make their little TV ventures here and there. Um, so it's just more of an homage to the SATs. Also, I do a Styles Clash, but that's just something that I pull out every now and then on a smaller guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I remember the last show we went to that TOS, and I just hopped oh for that Styles Clash. I'm like, like just seeing it, I'm like, oh my god, just a normal Styles Clash. <laughs> yeah. You're like. That's going to hurt, but then off the top sometimes it's like, oh, my yeah. God. A uh, little to carry off that question that Tiff asked, um, would you say you have that influence of, like, the Maximos and even Red? Because you do pull yeah. off a code Red as well, and I'm like, when you hit it, I'm like, it's so clean. Like, it's like, I'm like, wow, it's like watching Red do it because you pull their, it off very their well. Their style, 
their style revolutionized a whole group of dudes. Like uh, when you've seen Red and Ro- Will Ospreay wrestle, Will Ospreay shouted out Amazing Red because when he was coming up, he was watching Amazing Red do do all types of wild stuff. Like yeah. Amazing Red was so ahead of his time, man. I remember watching tapes of him in upstate New or him in upstate Jersey and New York, like these local small indies, like just doing the craziest shit. Like what is he doing? There's <laughs> <laughs> like twenty people in the crowd. Um, it, him and like Chris Devine, SATs. Brian Excel, all them, all them New York guys with that wild style. And you had you had like homicide, low key. You had the more strong style guys like Dan Moff, Steve Mack, dude, the whole JP roster basically. <laughs> uh, before I got into wrestling, um, oh, those man. guys helped revolutionize the style of wrestling within that area, especially Red. Like everybody wanted to, to come off the top rope. Everybody wanted to do these wild like karate spots with the blocking everybody wanted to do these running fast spots like like look at the style now it's basically what he was doing just just a tiny bit of a more tweak on it now yeah wow oh definitely wow. definitely like oh yeah and that matrix minute i feel like everyone has tried to replicate it and i don't think anyone you can't yeah, like... it'll never be that clean <laughs> it'll never be that clean ever. it's crazy even a few years ago red and key had another match for house of glory they couldn't pull it off again they tried, and it's like, mm. it's that once-in-a-lifetime moment. Oh, man. You're not that young uh-huh. anymore, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're not those young guys anymore. But that's oh, got to be, like, so cool for, like, even you to, like, like kind of, like, idolize these guys, but then to, like, actually, like, be in the ring with them. Like, it to me, like I said, like, I, I fangirl. I don't care. I say it on the podcast. I don't care what anybody says. Like, I fangirl all you guys. And that's got to be, you know, like, you guys are just like us, like, normal people. So, but, like, that's, don't laugh at me because it's true. But, like, at the same time, it's like, God, like, it's got to be something for you guys, like, to step in the ring with somebody somebody you idolize. So. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, uh, around 2003, 2004, like I said, I got huge into indie wrestling. Uh, I started watching a lot of Ring of Honor, and Homicide was a guy that was getting a lot of shine in Ring of Honor, and I started watching a lot of his stuff. And when I first started wrestling, a lot of people were like, you have kind of like these Homicide manneris- mannerisms and stuff. Because they were like, you had that kind of New York style, that look in your eyes. I was like, yeah. I was like, I watch Homicide stuff. I'm a big fan. And uh, GCW a while back gave me the opportunity to be in the ring with him. And that was like one of my dream matches, uh, cut and dry. And I got to do that. I was like, well, mark that off the list. Uh, <laughs> and it was an amazing experience. Um, I learned that those, that like experienced wrestlers have a lot of tricks and trades. Like uh, there is a moment uh, I was trying to strike exchange with Homicide in our match. And um, he literally, I egged him on, and instead of him like feeding into it, it was such a veteran move, he um, he eye raked me. I was like, oh, I hate you. Why did you do that? Like, uh, I should have thought of that first. Like, he's just he's like, a wealth nah. of knowledge. Like, guys like me look up to a guy like that because he's he has a wealth of knowledge. And when you think you have the upper hand on somebody with that much experience, really you don't because he knows every trick of the trade. Yeah. Yeah, that's so awesome. Oh, my goodness. I love it. I love it. Um, So we have another fan tweet from our girl, Jewel. She said, what would be your dream deathmatch opponent? Uh, I don't. If Matsunaga was still young enough to do a deathmatch, that would probably be the only one. Because I've wrestled Takeda. I've wrestled Kasai. I've pretty much wrestled the guys that I wanted to have the, a dream match with when I really got into the style. You know, I wrestled Masada, too, who I who I looked up to for a long time. Dude dude has so much experience. He's crazy. He's, <laughs> he's, real, he's as real as it gets. He does not play games. He will chop you down immediately. Um, you know, but he was he was nice enough to work with me, and he really didn't have to. Um, the promoter actually had to stay on him to make sure he came to the show because – he, he really doesn't, like, his business now, like, pretty much makes ends meet. He doesn't wrestle as much as he used to, and, and it's rare that promoters can get him to come out to do shows. So uh, getting to wrestle Masada was a big deal, too. Um, I've pretty much I've pretty much scratched it all off the list. Nick Gage, everybody you can think about on the, the U.S. scene, um, and even the Japanese scene. So I don't really have too many death matches. I mean, I could say Matsunaga, but, you know, that's, 
that's a far off dream that'll never happen. I've met him many a times. He's just he's happy doing what he's doing. He's an older man. You know, he has no rhyme or reason to go in there and get cut up. Mm, interesting, yeah. interesting. Well, I'm gonna sit here and still preach for Akira. So, <laughs> Danny Jamato, let's go. He's young. He's young. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I get it. No, because uh, and I don't want to throw the backstage info out there, but you know, I know Danny's high on him because yeah, he know. has a lot of potential. I yeah. get it. But like I've told Danny before, I'm like, I want to see this kid progress yeah. and get experience and get some more matches under his belt. You know, he's had a few good ones. We all have yes. a few good ones. It takes time for you to become seasoned. Yeah. And to understand things, because I'll still talk to Akira every now and then. He'll hit me up and we'll have a conversation. He'll ask me questions and trying to kind of get a feel for what he should and shouldn't be doing in the ring. Because I do, I study everybody and I, I watch everybody and I always pick people's stuff apart. I pick my stuff apart. So, I mean, I just want to see, I hope that they hold off on that till he gets a little bit more experience. Because I feel like it'll be better than yeah. just rushing into it. But, you know, that's not my decision. Yeah. He, I'm not the money guy. He told you me. You pay me, I'll do it. <laughs> he told me in due time. That's what Dan, That's what Danny's answer was to me. He's like, calm down in due time. And I was like, all right. <laughs> like, I'm waiting yeah. for it. But this is my, my bucket list. So, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> uh, Off that, though, like, is there anyone, let's say, maybe not in that death match style, that would be a dream opponent. Like you mentioned earlier, like you're influenced by that tri-state early 2000s era. Were any of those guys, like outside of maybe Homicide then, any of them that you would want to face right now? Maybe not because a lot, when you think of dream matches, at least from my perspective, it's a lot of guys you kind of came up watching. Yeah. You know, and like I said, Homicide was the was my dream match. I, I would watch him and I would watch Jack Evans a lot too. I would watch a lot of their stuff, and I got the chance to wrestle Homicide. I would like to do it again, maybe a hardcore style match. Oh, but, like, you know, I've been in the ring with him, and I pretty much got the opportunity to be in the ring with somebody who was one of my dream opponents. So I don't really think outside of that there there is anybody that I'm, like, grasping on to, to wrestle, per se. Okay. Oh, my God. Gotcha, okay. gotcha. Uh, my next question, though, can you talk to us a little bit about your relationship with the Reverend John Dahmer? Oh, oh, well, John Dahmer was one of my main trainers. Um, he taught me a lot about the business, man. Um, shout out to John Dahmer. I haven't spoke to him in forever. He probably won't watch this because he's just an old man who doesn't do that type of stuff. <laughs> but, uh, you know, outside of DJ, because everybody gives DJ crap, you know, he, DJ helped us a lot in the earlier years with a lot of stuff. But Dahmer really uh, pushed in our basics like, he was the one who really built the foundation for me and a lot of other guys like Joe Gacy as uh, professional wrestlers. So so my relationship with, with John will always be he'll be my wrestling dad. Outside of Zandig, he'll be my wrestling dad, you know, and uh, that's just the way uh, our relationship will always be. I'll always be in debt to, to that man for teaching me so much. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Um, so what's been your favorite moment in the ring thus far? A lot. There's a lot of them. <laughs> There's a no. Uh, I sure. could go uh, when Danny Havoc retired his retirement match, and um, there's that moment where we're both laying there because I was literally messed up. Like uh, I did the Spanish fly off the ladder and landed on my head and just literally plopped on his body and just laid there because I was really messed up. Oh, wow. But uh, we had that moment where we first got up, and I was like, you know, besides the emotion of it being his final match, I was like profusely bleeding and um the moment got to me and i uh, you know i finally got to shake his hand after denying it at the beginning of the match which is the story we were kind of telling and i got to shake his hand and then send him off and that to me was one of the most surreal moments um there's also another one uh, i did a ladder match where i won the wired the ccw wired title where it was like me ar fox andrew everett shane strickland i don't know if there's anyone else in there i think that was it but uh i faked the injury uh, towards the end of the match and as one of the guys was going up to grab the belt like I ran out and everybody literally thought I was injured like I broke my neck I ran out and like pulled him down and snatched the belt and I can't outside of that I can't recall getting so much heat from something like wow. that from faking an injury <laughs> it was nuts and uh, I remember that moment specifically because I got to the back and I went into the locker room and DJ screamed at me from across the locker room and threw a bottle at my head like a glass bottle <laughs> and I literally dodged it as it broke and he was like why would you do that 
Like, that's so uncalled for. And I was like, because I told no one I was doing this. I literally told me, and I may have told uh, two other people in the match that I was going to do this. I didn't tell any of the boys in the back. I didn't tell DJ. I didn't tell Maven. I didn't tell security. I didn't tell anybody that this was going to happen. I literally kept it to myself and uh, made everybody think I broke my neck. So I oh, came wow. to the back, and the, min- the moment I'm telling the uh, the EMT, like, get, the s- get straps off me. I'm fine. I'm fine. I had one of the guys... Uh, one of the uh jay christ he knew that i was gonna fake the injury he was like he's fine he was faking it and the look on everybody's face was like you mother (laughs) effer how dare you and i run out and uh snatch the belt and the crowd's like just going nuts just hating me it was amazing one of the most amazing moments ever man if you want to get heat like oh god (laughs) don't tell anyone you're gonna fake injury (laughs) oh my god <laughs> oh um, man. Oh jeez. <laughs> go, go ahead, right? I can only imagine the fans there like the reaction cuz if you see anything like you think someone really gets hurt, you're like you just get like oh man, it's crazy to see. Yeah. To then see that, oh man, I can only imagine the like just shock be like what the like, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> oh man, that's crazy. But let's keep it going. Let's um, if there was one person you could face to get in a heartbeat, who would it be? Oh man! Anytime Takeda gets offered, I'm I'm hopping in there. Um, he's just so good, man. He's he's not only just one of the craziest dudes I've ever met in my life. Like he's just his wrestling is just so on point, and like you know, it could be an off day for me, but somehow he manages to make the match that much better. Even so, oh, you like okay. it. Um, if you could travel to any promotion, where would it be, and who would your opponent be? That's rough. Uh, <laughs> uh, Got to keep mean... everybody on the toys toes around here, pretty much. And I'm trying to think because now we're in COVID. <laughs> I ain't traveling nowhere. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Like let's. Oh uh, yeah. Like, just, let's let's keep... think like let's that everything's okay and you could travel. Like you know, like what's the promotion and who would you wrestle against if everything was fine? Well, I. I'd like to go back to Japan again and wrestle for one of the big titles there. Like, uh, I, I'm hoping somehow in my world of wisdom I can figure out a way to uh, end up wrestling for maybe the, the Freedom's KFC title at some point. Uh, they got a young guy, Toru, there who's the champion. He's been a champion for a while, and um, he's had some real big matches. And I've been over a bunch and, and had conversations with all those guys, and I even wrestled Sasaki, who's the president, mm. um, and I'm pretty sure everybody knows I kind of have the skill. It's just a matter of, you know, Japan's just a real different, they're a different culture. The way they run their wrestling shows are different, just their whole locker room. Everything's, like, completely different from America. They're very, their storylines and the way they move into move people into the title picture is very, like, methodical, very slow-paced. Like, as you know, in the U.S. Indies, like, when somebody's hot, people are banking on it. They're not yep. waiting. In Japan somebody can be the hottest star like Kota Ibushi or something and they're going to wait another two or three years before they actually give that guy a push right yep. so uh you know my goal is to figure out a way to uh get freedoms to let me uh wrestle their champion for their title at some point in life mm. um regardless if it's in Japan or on the uh U.S. soil mm. yeah. I like oh, it definitely. It's, that's true and over there it's like I feel like it's because of that art form feel yeah, like it's definitely bigger in Japan. Like everything, they they truly treat this like a sport. A sport. Yeah, and I I say mm-hmm. that's why, to me, if I do anything in wrestling, my biggest goal is just to make it once to Japan. But like that over it's there, it's a different feel, man. It just oh. one day, one day. It's right? literally like you're a sports you're a sports star over there. No. Like there's people there's people who literally cry, who like have hysterical like fits when they're meeting you you don't understand how oh, wow. like i saw a girl fall on her knees and cry over jimmy lloyd oh wow oh. Oh. over oh. jimmy oh, <laughs> where am i <laughs> when my first tour like there was girls over the uh, merch table screaming Rava, Rava, like crying like oh. i'm like oh my god i don't know where i'm at <laughs> Oh, it's wild <laughs> wild it's like it's like pandemonium like it's fandom at its finest like they literally believe that that we are like sports stars we're right. stars over there it's crazy yeah oh man really I love it. that's the goal 
<laughs> the girl to go visit insane. Japan. Go ahead, Ray. You get there. I'm going to travel along and I'll be your fangirl, Ray. I'm like, oh, Ray. <laughs> it's, a one trip I, it, it's a trip I'd suggest to anybody in general. Like, I love Japan in general. Yeah. Like, if I had the means to, to go there and live there, I would. Obviously, I have a family, so that's not the case. Right. But, like, I thought Japan was an amazing country. Like, everybody's so respectful. You know, and one thing you notice is, like, when you're over there is uh, the, everyone, even in the subways and everything, is, are very quiet. The streets are very quiet. You could barely hear the cars go by. Wow. Uh, once once it hits dark, nobody's really outside uh, in the streets other than maybe inside, like, Tokyo, like, the major parts, like Red Light District. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was easy to notice because imagine uh, about eight Ameri- loud Americans on a subway and all these Japanese people were just quietly sitting with their hands folded over their lap and uh, a bunch of loud, rude and obnoxious Americans are just being <laughs> loud in us. And I was just like, man, I tried to assimilate the best I could when I was over there. <laughs> when you got guys like Schlack running around like Godzilla, it's kind of hard to do that. <laughs> It was funny because uh, Ryan T was talking about his first trip to Japan. I was so excited to hear about his trip. So, like, when I actually got to see him at I, uh, ICW, uh, I think it was that we were chatting about it, and, and he was so excited. I was I was so excited for him. I was like, oh, this is so great. So that's the goal. That's the goal. It's <laughs> the goal. Oh, there. Man. One day. One, one day. day. So. Uh, but let's keep it going. Uh, biggest thing, I feel like we, we have to give you yeah. the biggest congratulations for your recent victory of the fifth tournament of survival. But the real question is, what does it mean for you to get this vi- this victory in a grueling tournament like that, but also doing it in honor of a fallen brother, Danny Havoc? Uh, everything. I mean, as some people know, uh, Danny Havoc won the first one. Um, and... Uh, you know, we were, he was like family to me. And ever since, you know, he's died, I, you know, I've, everyone sees I'm on Twitter and then every now and then I'll post about him. And, you know, uh, I just felt like it was the right time to do something in honor of him, you know, and I brought it up to office, to the office, uh, pre tournament that I wanted at, to at some point come out to his theme music and kind of pay, pay honor and homage to, to somebody who was quite possibly one of the greatest deathmatch wrestlers, that to ever come out of the U S you know, uh, and also somebody who I thought was like a family member to me. Um, you know, and TOS in general is a big deal. Like the fact that, that I won twice to me, even is a big deal. I'm like, what does anyone see in me to let me win twice? Like you got guys like Schlack who are chomping at the bit to win tournaments. Um, and you had Ricky Shane page who, even though Ricky does his antics with the whole four, four Oh stuff, like he's still one of the best deathmatch wrestlers in the world and he could turn it on at any time you know um it was just dude it was just a big deal like it means a lot it's like when's the next time we're gonna see somebody win the tos twice you know yeah. maybe never so good it's so good I, I like i said i was so glad to be a part of that we were so happy i loved every minute of it so oof, can uh congratulate you enough so um so I have an infamous question that I ask everybody that comes on this podcast. What's the craziest thing a fan's done to get your attention? (laughs) Oh boy. I don't think fans have really done anything crazy to get my attention. (laughs) I've had, I've had Japanese fans like make signs, make a sign for me and be like, Oh, Alex. And and I'd be like, Oh, I have a sign to take home. (laughs) But nothing really crazy. I've I've never had fans do anything really nuts. Oh, wow. uh, Try to, get my attention in any way wow see now we have to like do something right <laughs> so you have a story um, to come back on like another no <laughs> ray's like not me not me yeah, maybe I, gonna say, I feel i feel like the reason they don't is like if you're seeing him take these light tubes <laughs> you're seeing him beat the shit out of a lot of people you might not want to mess with this dude <laughs> so uh i think i'm good <laughs> Well, well, if you, you see me after a crazy death match, yeah. not only am I bloody, but like I'm barely moving. Like I'm over <laughs> yeah. here, like like an old man, like robot, robot esque, like moving my hands. Like I don't want to touch you because I have blood on me. Uh. Yeah, I Japan, got Japan. It was weird. Like people were having like like seizures and stuff out of excitement because I literally <laughs> didn't clean up after Japan. I just went out to the merch table, completely drenched in blood, and people were like excited. Like I never seen a a, a 
a thing of excitement like the way they were in Japan. In America, I'm always afraid to touch people, especially now. Yeah, it's like social distance. I can't touch you. Yeah, I, feel, and, I can't move in general because all the fiberglass on me is like it's crazy. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I have to meet him after this show. Like, I think I like darted on Ray. I was like, he's over there. Bye. <laughs> I was like, I yeah, we're having a whole convo, and we just see him. We see you from the corner of our eye. Zoom. I'm like, <laughs> I think right, like two. Beeline. I think two people were like Tiff, or like I'll catch you later. <laughs> it's like because sometimes it's hard to like grab people. Like I know people dart after their match or yeah. whatever the scenario is, and you were definitely one that I was like, okay, like I have to meet in person. Um, you know, but like I said, a lot of people dart. I'm like, damn it, I miss I miss people all the time. So, but you definitely are like obviously we're doing this interview, and you're like again, like I say, like you're like this normal person, just like me and Ray. <laughs> and like, or yeah. we've had our crazy shares of people. But like, I'm no, I'm no different. We could all three walk, walk out in the streets in upstate Jersey or New York, and nobody would even know who the yeah. hell I was. <laughs> you, know, you two would be the only ones <laughs> out of us walking into the street. <laughs> This is Alex. Well, who's that? Who cares? I feel like you, I, you already know how upstate is. Who cares? Who's that I don't care. Well, we're both like city people, so it's like definitely. But like me, I'm like again, like I always say, like I'm I'm the fan girl. I'd like raising the business, and I'm not. So it's kind of interesting. Like we hang out with people that are wrestlers, and I'm. I think now, like I'm so much like whatever now. But it's kind of funny when like people see me take pictures with certain people. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm like, it's not that serious. Like, <laughs> they're just there's, like us. There's maybe been one occasion in my life where I've literally been walking into a store, or I think I was like at a flea market or something in the Midwest at all places, and some dude had a CZW hat on. He literally turned around and was like, Alex Cologne. I was like, oh, hey, hi. I'm <laughs> um, going back to shopping now. <laughs> You're the only person here who knows me. Coming back to shopping now. <laughs> Oh, oh man. man. <laughs> that's that's... <laughs> Go ahead, um, Oh jeez. Okay. So, um so I wanted to word this question the right way cuz I feel like we touched on it earlier about um would you label yourself a deathmatch wrestler? Cuz I feel like I ask it this way because I feel like everyone bubbles you guys in as solely that. To me, I feel like end of the day like you guys are wrestlers. Right. The death yeah. match is that little like asterisk, but it's like end of the day, like I talked about earlier, like your code red is clean, cleaner than a lot of the indie guys. And it's like, I feel like you guys are not just that. You guys are a lot more. But what would you like label yourself if you had to put yourself somewhere? I mean, I guess, I guess you could say I'm a death match wrestler. I mean, if you're doing it regularly, it's kind of like, it's unfortunately, it's kind of the thing uh, bestowed upon you. Um, and like you said, we're all wrestlers. Like, it, it, I mean, every now and then I have a regular wrestling match when somebody's not trying to book me to die, um, you know. So I just, I'll just say I'm whatever you think I am at this point. Like, uh, you know, we're in a very socially conscious, conscious world. So uh, it, whatever anybody wants to call me is fine with them. Um, Deathmatch wrestler, wrestler, hardcore wrestler, mud show guy, whatever. Doesn't really bother. <laughs> like, if I wrestle a regular match, I could put on a, a headlock. And if I wrestle in a death match, I could hit you with a light tube. Either or. Doesn't matter. <laughs> light awesome, tubes. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry, I love light not tubes. That <laughs> not that fun. Well, I'm not, I'm not taking them. I just I just like to watch them. But <laughs> <laughs> um, So, is there any newcomers in the business that you have your eye on that you'd like to step in the ring? I mean, I know we talked about Akira a little bit, but... Uh... Maybe him or, like, maybe somebody else that you have your eye on? Uh, Deathmatch-wise, I think Akira and, and I was in the ring with Alex Ocean. He has a long way to come, yeah. to. I think they they both are on the right track. It's just it's a matter of experience. I tell the young dudes that all the time. It's a matter of experience. Outside of that, uh, yeah, I'm just waiting to see more faces um, in the Deathmatch world, which it, we're a very tight-knit circle, as you guys know. Like, there's not a lot of deathmatch wrestlers, at least good ones, running around everywhere. Um, and, you know, and a lot of, like, I always tell the young guys, I'm like, focus on your wrestling first before you want to do deathmatches. It's going to make you a much better wrestler. And if things don't work out in the deathmatch world and you're not really into it, you can just go back to being a regular wrestler again. So. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> That's awesome to see. Um, I answered it. I kind of didn't answer it. <laughs> in, in a way, yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's, definitely. It yeah. 
Um, so with everything going on, sadly, we're in this pandemic, but finally the little glimpse of light is showing. Wrestling is coming back little by little. Um, what does that mean to you, like getting to perform again and getting to go out there and do uh, whatever you do in the ring? Like, um, it's it's good because uh, you know there was that there was that stretch. What was it, a month or two months, where no wrestling was going on, and you know a lot of people, you know me at times, including myself, we tend to revolve everything around a show. So. We're waking up, and then we're going to the gym, and we're we're trying to find ring time so we can get ready for a show. Uh, we're watching tape so we can get ready for a show. You know what I mean? We're taught we're getting our our uh, merch table stuff ready so we can get ready for a show. Uh, so during that time, like it, it's just really, especially me, I was just buying time, trying to trying to find new hobbies, different things to get into, spend more time with my family, do stuff like that. Um, and it being back is just. It's a way for us to to make a living and continue living out this dream, and for a lot of dudes, their careers. Because this, for a lot of people, this is the how they make their money. This is how they pay their bills, you know. So, it, I mean, I'm glad wrestling is coming back. Uh, hopefully, we don't have any setbacks. And you know, in my personal opinion, I don't know if this COVID thing is going to go away anytime soon. But I'm glad that there's a lot of wrestling companies that are actually taking the initiative to try to make guidelines and try to do stuff to kind of keep everybody safe. So, you know, hopefully more companies follow suit so then we can get wrestling on a full scale. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yep. And so Here's important. Hoping, yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, so what do you like to do when you're not in the squared circle? Uh, watch wrestling. See, <laughs> 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 do I like wrestling? <laughs> Um, I don't, I don't really do much. Uh, I spend time with my family. Uh, my daughter's into Fortnite, so <laughs> it's time to catch me on Fortnite. Dude, she's five, she's five, and she's sniping people. Like, I like, saw what? your tweet. I, I was going to bring it up. I, I was going to bring it up, but I remember you put a tweet out, and you're like, you could only imagine if people actually knew that, like, she was five years old, and you're yeah. killing all these people, no, and how mad killing, they probably she's are. She's these people sniping them from, like, 100 meters, like, 180 meters. Ray, you know now like, if we're getting wow. sniped. Sniped. I can't even shoot that good. Like crazy. Now I'm thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, well, we're getting sniped. We know it's his Imagine daughter. It's... It could have been my five year old daughter, bro. It could have been my five year old daughter. See? See, Ray, we get so Take mad. See? See? <laughs> Damn it, Ray. Wow. I said let I said let it happen. She wants to become a professional gamer, that's fine. She can take care of me when I get older. <laughs> Oh man. oh man i love that's... it <laughs> <laughs> it broke right oh, and it broke me now because now i'm like you're thinking about it now five-year-old like yeah because oh, we get really bad when we play too fortnite much, too we're like shit <laughs> <laughs> we curse a lot on that game but anyway <laughs> oh, <laughs> go ahead right we're coming down to our yep. final two. Oh man yep we're getting down to it so the nitty-gritty question here what's the end goal what would you like the legacy of alice cologne to be you know, I don't know. I think about it, and, you know, um, I don't know. I just, I want to be able to leave something for maybe my daughter to remember me by. Because, like, I'm doing death matches. I don't expect to live the longest life in the world, unfortunately. I'm sorry to break it to everybody. A lot of death match dudes don't live long. <laughs> but uh, I want to be able to leave something so my daughter can say, hey, you know, because when I went to Japan, I got... We got Ribera jackets. I got lucky to get one on my second tour. I tried to get one on my first tour. Didn't work out. Um, on the second tour, I got one. And I didn't get it for me. I don't... The jacket is more because I wanted it to pass it down to my daughter. So when she gets older, she can wear it. And maybe something she won't like wearing, but she'll have it. And she can be like, hey, my dad was once a wrestler. And he got to go to Japan, which a lot of people don't get to do. And uh, got to wrestle some of the best hardcore wrestlers over there so uh legacy wise it, i don't see that for me is leaving any type of a legacy for uh anybody other than probably my kid you know and there's a lot of guys out there i think that that uh wrestling wise they're gonna leave a legacy for future wrestlers to come in and be like dude that guy was so good this and that that and this but for me i don't i don't think that's the case you know unfortunately I like that. It's like so, like real and like raw, and I like I I love that. So, 
Yeah. So I many, like so many few people get to actually leave a mark. Like yeah. I don't think people yeah. realize that. Like, um, you know, there's there's guys from back in the day, like during that time period, you're like, oh my god, this guy's so amazing. And then once they stop wrestling, they kind of disappear. People forget about them. They might not exist in that person's realm because you'll still be watching wrestling. But it's like, what have you done for me lately? It's not what have you done for me in the past. Right. So you know, Actually. I don't, I don't try to, I don't try to think outside of my bounds. Like if I was somebody who was on TV or had reach of that nature, maybe. But it's more about leaving something for my daughter to remember me by and say, hey, my dad actually did something when he was living. It wasn't like he just worked a nine to five and then came yeah. home and just lived a dreary life. He actually did something exciting. No, yeah. Um, I, I not to correct you, but I feel like. Just as a student of the game myself, I feel like, at least to me, you definitely left the mark for this business. Because you're definitely a hybrid, I would say, of a wrestler. Because, again, you do that deathmatch style. But I've seen, again, like the stuff you can do that isn't the deathmatch. It's re the wrestling itself that you can do both. And there's not many people that pull it off as good as you do. So I'll definitely say, just from my opinion, again, I'm, I still study everything. Uh, I say you left your mark, definitely. Thank you. Aww. Well, I'm it. glad I could give you something to, to watch when you're older and be like, he was fucking stupid, wasn't he? <laughs> Don't do that, kid. Don't do that. <laughs> so, but we're gonna we're gonna get Alex on the Chop Ray movement just just so everybody knows that listens to this podcast. <laughs> can't do it i'll just i'll i'll tag in schlack i don't like that. Uh, oh. schlack. <laughs> i think he's a little scared of schlack i think i think if i say that i think he's gonna go darting running <laughs> i was like he's a he's a he sweetheart did. of a human yes being, he is trust me he's a sweetheart he totally, don't let him fool you no i know that <laughs> like i met him too at the gcw show and I'm like, he's so sweet i love it i love it i think i think people get like nervous but then the, they're always like the biggest sweethearts in the world and i love it um, all right, so we're going to finish this off with one final question. To all inspiring or amateur wrestlers out there, what's a piece of advice that you would give them? Um, come in and learn as much as possible and uh, be humble, you know. And there's a lot of guys who are humble in this business. But every now and then, you know, we get on Twitter. We let social media kind of get in our heads. And we're talking all off off script. We're talking wild. And even sometimes I'll like I'll say something I won't think about it, and I'll be like, uh, I should have been a little bit more reserved, you know. And sometimes in this business, it's really not about being reserved. It's kind of throwing yourself out there. But at the same time, at least have enough knack to to just stay open minded and and take as much in as possible because. Any criticism from – it doesn't matter if it's a fan or the guy in the back or the promoter. You could take a little bit of everything. You don't have to take the whole thing. I tell guys all the time, like, if you want my you want my opinion, I'll give you my opinion. I don't expect you to take the whole opinion. I expect you to take bits and pieces and fit it into what fits you best. Yeah. I love Good. it. I love awesome. it. I love it. Awesome. I love it. Oh, my goodness. Um Guys, like uh, I have a free promo code for you guys for Power Slam TV. <laughs> You're laughing at me. <laughs> if you guys want to watch some wrestling, uh, advertise. <laughs> gotta advertise a little bit for gotcha, you guys out gotcha. there. <laughs> the use code no holds free to enjoy one month free as well. So we love them over there. So, uh, Alex, where can everybody find you if they want to like come find you? Uh, seek me out on Twitter, uh, Alex Cologne 139 Um, you could try to seek me out on Facebook. Rarely do I accept friend requests unless, uh, I, I know you or I've seen you a bunch. Um, that's just, dude, I have 800 friend requests waiting to be accepted <laughs> because I'm just, I'm not on Facebook like that unless yeah. it's just messenger talking to the guys about stuff. But, uh, Twitter's the best way to reach me. I usually answer everybody on Twitter. So hit me up on Twitter. Um, I had an Instagram for two seconds uh, once COVID hit, I really had nothing to post about, so I got rid of it. Uh, so Twitter it is, y'all. Hit me up. Awesome, awesome. Is there any upcoming shows that you're gonna be on that uh, to tell everybody like they can like find you? At or... uh, I'll I'll be at Time Bomb Pro coming up. Uh, I'm wrestling Orn Vite, who I will destroy in uh, the best ways possible. No, I love the kid. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Right, no. I'm you not taking it easy on it. Uh, Time Bomb Pro. And then in a couple weeks, I'll be at Unsanctioned Pro, which usually is out of Columbus, but it will be in Indiana. Um, obviously, search those promotions for all that upcoming stuff. And then I'll have a bunch of Jersey stuff and 
East Coast stuff coming up too in October that I really can't get into until the shows are announced. So. Awesome, awesome. Probably uh, me and Ray might actually be down to one of those shows, hopefully. So we'll see. Yeah, Since definitely. like we've been living in Jersey lately for all the wrestling shows, <laughs> <laughs> not getting anything here in New York. So it doesn't yeah. matter anyway. We go over to Jersey anyway all the time. I feel like every weekend I'm in Jersey, but. <laughs> Anyway, um, time to move, I guess. Maybe I don't know. Nobody maybe like it. <laughs> I, I feel like we're gonna have to move because there's just so much awesome wrestling in Jersey, and it's like everybody's jealous of me that 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 I'm in New York, and and they're like, oh, you got the best wrestling, but I don't know. The last like six months, I've been like living in Jersey, like or maybe even longer. We've been going to Jersey every week to watch yep. wrestling. So, and I'm waiting for GCW to come back to Atlantic City because we had so much fun. So nope. I get tired of paying that toll. <laughs> I know it's killer. <laughs> Go over the bridge. You got to go over the bridge. I'm not. I'm tired of being that. Oh, no, that, get out. That fifteen dollar. Oh, that fifteen dollar bridge. You're killing me, bro. Yo, <laughs> what? Yo, I'm done. That's all I gotta say. Fifteen dollars there. Fifteen dollars back. Shit. Like you guys are killing me. So come you're to You're paying for a ticket to the show. Then you're paying for a ticket to the show. I like, know. <laughs> I know. Nah, but I love it. I love it. I love it. So anyway, but guys, thank you so much for watching. Again, I'm your host as always, the EVP Giggles, the Heartbreak Chick, the Queen of the Indies. That's the law, Ray Ramundo. And then thank you again so much to our special guest, Alex Cologne. And we thank will you. talk to you guys very soon. There's something you will